Jesse. Good evening, ladies and gentlemen. This is a regularly scheduled meeting of the Sunderland Board of Selectmen. It's Monday, May 16th, 2016. We have a um, pretty full agenda this evening. We are going to start with, uh, we have three finalists for Chief of Police. Uh, we have one candidate. We're lucky to have Jan here, Jane, Jane. <laughs> uh, tonight um, to talk to us. Um, we've already warned her about being on TV. She says she's uh, finally being on camera. Um, so uh, we do have, if anybody, uh, we are going to continue our interviews um, tomorrow night and Wednesday night. And then we'll probably have a deliberation. We'll start talking about final choices, I would think, what, next week, Scott? Same David? Monday, yeah. Mm -hmm. Start talking about that. Hmm. And... Uh, and we will go into uh, talk about that. And typically, what we would do is, uh, if we decide to make an offer, um, we would then sit down and do the good part. Uh, we do have, in the past, we had a contract with our with our chief, something we don't have to have, but we we feel it works both ways to have a contract. Uh, we do. Uh, we will talk about that and. See what else we talk about. Terms and conditions. Um, usually, it's not too bad. Salary. All those good things about salaries and benefits. So, any other questions before Scott? Statements, Scott, David. Yeah, that's all good. No. Sherry, you all set? All set. All right, Mr. Bergeron, you want to start the questioning? In uh, Jane. Uh, Jane's currently a sergeant in the. Town of Munson. Town of Munson. Right. Well, first, first, Jane, thanks so much for coming again. I'm Scott Bergeron, and thanks to the, the group, the screening committee, for drink, uh, delivering such such a, uh, frankly, uh, a deep bench for us to choose from. So <laughs> thank you, guys. Uh, we've got about 10, 12, 21 scripted questions. Oh, boy. <laughs> You're all getting the same thing. Each is, there's, there's a lightning round. It happens at about minute 45, so just... It'll be fine. Okay. All right. So um, we actually have, literally have really scripted questions that we've uh, shared um, with Sherry, taken some guidance from the screening committee. Um, and if I could, Tom, I'm not going to go necessarily one through blank. I'm just going to pick one. Does that work? Or do you want to go one through? Um, I don't care. Just got to cover most guys. We'll start with number one then. Eventually it comes around to the good ones, right? So, good, uh, good Jane. Choice. Jane, if you would uh, uh, describe three specific accomplishments in your current uh, local government law enforcement career uh, that you would actually consider to be significant. I think my, my first accomplishment would be becoming a sergeant, sort of taking on a, a new role with some new responsibility. Um, I've I've had some different experiences as a patrol officer, but once you become a supervisor, there's just a whole another element to right. things. Uh, and uh, in that position, I, I've taken on quite a lot of administrative work, so that's sort of uh, you know above and beyond what I was used to. Uh, and in that sergeant role, uh, as far as accomplishments, I've sort of been given free reign to do some things to enhance some programs and uh, I took our field training officer program that really there wasn't much of a specific program in place and I revamped that and okay. we have now a specific program with um, just a you know manual for the uh, for the auxiliaries that are involved in the program and specific standards and things that have to be met and some checks and balances on that to make sure that the uh, that they're following in the program to make sure that we do get good candidates uh, to choose from for our part-time police force and <coughs> we the search committee knows I all the members well not all the members are here but I recognize these members here we talked about the tornado and that was something that I would view as an accomplishment, certainly a learning experience. Never have experienced something of that magnitude in my career or in my personal life. And 
pretty much I was in charge of running the operations from the police department and our chief ended up being um, at the command post which was a distance away and it was a tremendous learning experience and uh, something that hopefully I'll never have to experience again but um, I learned quite a bit about supervision from the point of um, accountability of, of our officers and uh, as far as the, the community there was just so much going on and sorry I'm getting a little off track I just uh, it was quite quite a quite an experience and again I learned a lot more about um, sort of the role of a supervisor from that and that you don't always have know the right thing to do have all the right answers but uh, you know the police force can really come together and uh, and get the job done so uh, that would be pretty significant in my career Tom could I would follow up sure sure same uh, Jane if I could at the beginning we talked about the sergeant's role and supervisor role and the taking on more administrative was that actually part of the job description or is this something you 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 picked up organically or a hybrid of the two there's three sergeants currently okay. in town yeah. and I was put in charge of training, but so many different things I find are falling under training. Huh? So I, I do all of the scheduling for the department, but I do um, monitor the training. I, I keep all the training records. I'm in charge of you know, the FDO coordinator, field training officer program coordinator. And uh, I do, I know you don't have civilian dispatchers here, but we have civilian dispatchers. Nice. and. Uh, so I apply for and I administer the grant that we have uh, for all their, their training and the quality assurance program that's in place through the state sure. and I maintain all the records and, and do that sort of thing. So, nice. so that was new and different to me, being involved in that. That is a different view, isn't it? It is. And I actually enjoy it. I really do enjoy it. It's, I love to learn and I find that I'm learning something new all the time by getting involved in, in different, different areas like that. Thanks so much. Scott, I'd like to follow up with that if I could. Sure. Jane, one of the, one of the things that you said is uh, during the tornado and during the event, um, your form of supervision became def more defined. Can you describe to us what in your past helped that supervision that made you make the right calls as well? I. I would say that I worked for someone that I worked for previously uh, groomed me in a manner to prepare me to take on a lot of things that I've encountered in my career specifically as a supervisor he was just a tremendous role model and oftentimes I fall back on what I viewed in him and the confidence that he exhibited and uh, I just I've come to realize that you, that really you can't be prepared for everything, but that you have to act and you just, you have to take everything into account that when you're a supervisor, you don't always have someone else to turn to and you have to make the decisions and you have, you have to make them. You, you can't wait for somebody else to step in and you do the best, best that you can. Okay. Thank you. David? Um, I don't have any follow-ups to that. Next question. Go? Okay. All right. Um, I'll go. I'll go right with number two. Explain your approach to promoting the concept of community-oriented policing throughout all sections of a police department. Community policing has definitely been the buzzword for a significant amount of time, yeah. and it's. It's just a must nowadays. It's not really something that's that's an option. And your officers, the townspeople, everybody has to buy into into it. Um, basically, it's you're creating sort of a partnership, a working relationship, um, give and take on both sides. That you have to be understanding of each other's needs. That it can't just be the chief telling the officers that you know we need to be 
community oriented. They have to buy in. They have to be out there. They have to want to do it, or it won't won't be happening. Right. And they really have to believe in it. When when you talk community policing, what and, and I think people have different views of what community policing is. Can you can you maybe expand on what your thoughts of community policing is? I think when when it first became popular, there were a lot of grants and things and I think at that point in time it was more let's put more officers out there, more officers out there interacting with the community. Uh, getting to know the community, community programs, things like, for instance, when in Southwick I um, was involved in RAD and RAD Kids, I've been involved in the D.A.R.E. program, a lot of things that are sponsored by grants. But as time has gone on, uh, the money's not necessarily there for a lot of the extra programs or extra officers. And so it's become more of a daily just a daily working relationship I think with the community that you need you certainly need to be out in the community as much as possible but we might not have the luxury of having officers specific for community policing so it's basically being out there working with the community finding out what 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 do they have as priorities what do they want from the police force and what needs do they have and how can the police force go about satisfying those needs helping you know, or helping individuals in the community with what's important to them or problems that they have, being responsive to their needs, but also that partnership where they understand that you can't do everything all at once for them and that there are constraints and that, uh, that, there, that there are other needs when it comes to money, um, but that if they know that you're doing the best and that you're able to prioritize things, to me that's what it's all about. If I could, uh, Jane, we'll follow up along those along the, the grant lines. Sure. Um, would you consider those grants, whether they be the RADs or the DARES? I had two kids in the DARE program. <laughs> they still remember Chief Gilbert as Chief Gilbert. Right. That's just the way it is, except he wasn't Chief right, Gilbert Right, right. You know, I was like, oh, yeah. Anyway, so that said, um, would you consider them, uh, their use in the towns that did use them, effective for maybe modifying the culture? Because I know grants can mean contact hours grants can mean more um, staff grants can mean more materials but at some point they have to affect I, I put this in the form of a question at some point do you think they affect the culture of either the police or the community or both because we can't, we can't live on. Anybody who knows has watched this for the last X amount of years I've been here. I have, I have some, I have some misgivings about grants because mm -hmm. they, they are, they are, they come with misgivings. Mm -hmm. But those in particular, as we talk about community policing and grant rounds and staff, we've actually turned down those grants where it's multiple years and then you pick up the full time employment years out. Mm -hmm. We just don't do that. But I do wonder if some of those programs actually had an impact on the culture of, in your experience, Munson, Southwick. Mm -hmm. I can say that the, the community certainly was very receptive mm -hmm. that in Southwick, for instance, those were new programs, something that, that had never been offered before. Okay. And they were real receptive to it. The, the, the kids enjoyed it, the adults, for the, the RAD, you know, the women's program. Mm -hmm. uh, and I think the hard part with grants, though, is that once you start, you know, you start offering these programs and then the grant money goes away, mm -hmm. then, you know, what do you do? Right. And uh, y you can't always fund them mm -hmm. with alternate means, mm -hmm. but you feel, in a way, you're doing a disservice to the community then because they like these things, you know? Um, and again, I think it's, it definitely, it, it causes a strain, I think, when that does happen as far as the, well, my experience in, in the police department aspect of it, the policing side, is that you enjoy these programs. The Citizens Police Academy was another. It's, it's uh, just 
a tremendous, tremendous program, and it's enjoyable for the officers, and the community really loves it. And uh, so I think that that it does change the culture because once you get involved in them, and you, you hate to let them go, and then I think you're not offering, for instance, once you let them go, the, the citizens aren't getting that well of a chance to see that side of, of policing or police officers. And, uh, but I know this, this, is, this has happened time and time again, and I know a lot of times even with uh, you know, different grant money, say, just for additional policing, and uh, that sometimes you know, different agencies don't qualify and things of that nature. So, so it's, it's a battle, you know, and I, I do feel like you want to try to offer those things, but I do understand what happens when they go away or they sure. can't be funded, and that it can be very disappointing to the community. Thanks, I appreciate mm -hmm. that. Yep. Thank you, Tim. Thank you very much, Jane. Mm -hmm. uh, based on your knowledge of our town mm -hmm. and its demographics, please identify the program areas you would focus upon and describe how you would intend to undertake the task of a new chief during your first six months on the job. My first six months, I know, would be uh, very busy <laughs> and stressful from the point of wanting to come in and know everything about everything and and. Uh, but I really think I would spend some time sitting back, getting the lay of the land. I have, you know, I've prepared well for this as far as I've done some research on the town of Sunderland, and I know a little bit of the makeup of the town, but as far as, you know, I, I would really need to get into the position, I think, to really get a feel for definitely what's working well, what are some problem areas um, to, to focus on, and I understand it is, you know, there's definitely a lot of like rental housing in town and uh, with the colleges around and I know it's um, that's quite a makeup I don't know if there are any issues from any of that but I also know some of the things that uh, as far as going on in town they're trying to revitalize some areas the the boat ramp and uh, trying to um, like a riverfront sort of sort of program and things like that what I'm getting is a feel for right now, it's a lot of maybe lack of staffing that might be a problem, uh, that there's been maybe some, you know, definitely there's, you know, money constraints in every department right now. And uh, seeing how we can best utilize the officers that we have and get them out into the community in different areas. But I wouldn't like to make you any promises right now or, what I would be jumping right into without first seeing what, you know, what the lay of the land is. If, if you had, in that first six months, who would be, who would be three of the main people that you'd want to talk to? If, had to? if there was three people that you'd want to talk to, who would they be? I would definitely, I don't know if I can hold you as a combined unit, but... <laughs> we wouldn't call the worse. Okay. <laughs> so, be, certainly the board and, and, and Sherry uh, would be important, just uh, would be important, but I would like to speak to Sergeant Brendan Lyons, because I know he's, he's in charge of operations right now. And... Uh, Really, I want to talk to everybody. So this is a hard decision because I want to talk to everybody. So, but as far as the the three, definitely, I think that my third would probably be the principal of the elementary school, Ben. Mm -hmm. You think that three questions fun? Wait till we get to the one about if you could if you could cook dinner for three historical <laughs> figures. Actually, Not Sherry's question, please. <laughs> <laughs> did she tell you I, about that? No, no, I saw it. I, <laughs> I did watch that, and and uh, 
I'm thinking, please don't ask me that. Please don't ask me that. <laughs> <laughs> because that was, that was not an easy question whatsoever. Yeah, but look, look, look what happened. But see, that's, I see that. I see that. Yeah, it's all good. So outside of interviewing and being on camera, when are you most satisfied in your job? <laughs> By the way, he works for the press. <laughs> Most satisfied. What am I currently most satisfied with yeah, in my when, job? When, when are you most satisfied? When, you know. I would say it's sort of my, I don't know if it, it's really a current status or more just the, the path that I've taken, that I'm, I'm really satisfied with the different roles that I've played and, and the growth um, that I've sustained. I've, I've just been involved in so many different things and and again, I just, I love to learn and, and I just, you know, from, I've, from working in different communities, first of all, I've worked for four different chiefs, I've had different supervisors, I've worked with several different officers, you know, I've been involved in the community programs, I've worked at the police academy, uh, I, you know, I've raised my kids in a community and been involved with their sports and, and I really, I really like being part of a community, feeling a part of it and having a vested interest in, in, in a community. I like the small town atmosphere. I was talking to the search committee. I have no desire to learn, to, to work in a, uh, a city or you know, anything really much larger, a uh, larger town, although I applaud them for the work that they do and the things that they're involved in on a daily basis. But uh, I, I like my role because it's a blend. Mm -hmm. I still get to get out although it's between midnight and eight, so I don't get to be involved as much in the community as I would like to or, sure. or see people as I would like to, but, uh, but I also do have that administrative function, and it, it keeps me busy, and, and it's interesting to me, and, and I like challenges and problem solving. I think that's sort of what I'm known as in my department. I'm sort of the problem solver, so uh, because I am very conscientious about my work, I mean, I just, I... I want to stay in the career. I'm not looking to get out of the career because I do enjoy it. Perfect. But. Thanks so much. <laughs> what, what what do you see as a follow up to that? What what do you see as the biggest difference between a a sergeant's position and a chief's position? Probably the the realm of responsibility. A sergeant, you're it's a little more compartmentalized. Maybe you're responsible for your shift more so than the entire operations but I like the freedom of that too that where you have the ability to make more decisions whereas you know a sergeant you you have limited decision making uh, I, you're still a sergeant you're sort of a half breed I think you're part manager and and part patrol officer but as a chief you also I think you do more of the management, but you're also, you know, at least my belief in a chief is the chief still needs to be out there as well. It's not strictly just a political position. And uh, so I, I think they're similar in that they are our management, but it's just definitely much more responsibility. And you, you just get, you know, it, I find it interesting. You get involved with all the different town agencies, you know, the Board of Selectmen, the Finance Committee, and, and uh, just all the different, a lot of different things that you normally as a sergeant you really wouldn't experience. I, I, I would hope if you had the position of chief in Sunderland that if we become political you let us know. <laughs> our, 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 goal, our goal isn't to be political, but we, I can see how it could happen and, and I would expect um, that the level of trust between the board and the chief could be so that we could have those honest conversations. Well, what I've seen so far is just from my experience with the search committee and just, you know, I've, I've watched some of your meetings and, and like I said, done some research on the town and it's just, I really feel like, like you're all just a bunch of, you know, just kind of down to earth people. <laughs> and I have to say that the search committee made me feel just, I don't know, so welcome. I felt at ease and I felt like we were just having a conversation and uh, I really enjoyed enjoyed that aspect of it. You know, the, the process has been great and uh, I just, 
I really feel like there's some nice people here, and, and I've enjoyed it. Just got a quick follow-up on that, if I could. Um, just sort of going along with the career path and things, what, I noticed you were a, a math teacher. What made you go from, like, <laughs> math teacher to police work? Yeah, what was the, what was the uh, I don't want to say motivation, but, you know, influence on kind of a little bit of a career change there? If I told you I had eighth graders, would that <laughs> 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 Okay, I can see that. <laughs> so police training started early then. Yeah. <laughs> Kind of like charity starting at home. Maybe. Right, right. <coughs> that I often ask myself that very question because it does not seem like a logical course of action. And I think my problem was I've always had so many interests that I never really knew what I wanted to do when I grow up. Oh. And uh, it's I loved math. I finally decided, you know, I'm good at math. I love math. Let, let me get my math degree and let's let's go from there. And I actually I do love to teach. But I found that I really just eighth, you know, eighth to twelfth graders wasn't really what I felt like I wanted to do as far as as, as far as teaching, and that I sort of stumbled upon policing sort of by accident, I think, and and uh, once I I sort of uh, became enamored with the field. I found that I can also incorporate my love for teaching into policing, mm -hmm. and so I sort of got the best of both worlds. So, um, so it it might seem sort of strange, but in my world, it, it sort of worked out. <laughs> good. 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 Worked out well. Good to you. All right. Um, <clears throat> How do you define fair and impartial policing, and how would you ensure that it's practiced in your department? Hmm, does that sound familiar? Yeah. <laughs> I wonder where, I wonder where that like came from. <laughs> <laughs> well, fair and impartial policing, it's, it's pretty much what we're, what we're seeing as far as, uh, because of everything that's been in social media lately, it's, it has to do with bias, uh, not performing any of your role uh, based upon bias. Um, actually, I, I just had a training on it not too long ago, and, and uh, it was interesting because we were taught that, that everyone has biases, but, um, you know, I might have a favorite color, for instance. You know, I might buy a pair of electric blue sneakers because I, I'm biased towards that color. I, whereas my mother would probably buy red and you know but that he, the biases that we become more concerned with with policing you know certainly with race and religion and gender and things like that those are the more popular ones that we hear on the police side and that basically any the way that you conduct yourself it's it has to be in an ethical manner that you're policing any any dealings you have with society or even within your own department I kind of view it the same that you have to act in a fair and impartial manner meaning that you're treating people the same I mean it's I, I've been a defensive tactics instructor and it, we've it's been ingrained in us that you're judged by what a reasonable officer would do in the same situation so you have to conduct yourself in a reasonable manner everything that you do and it certainly falls within your department as well and you can't act on favoritism and, uh, it just breeds discontent and you know, I've already gotten the impression from from Devin that they're a very unified force down there and uh, that's terrific, and I'd like to keep it that way. Thank you. Mm -hmm. um, you'll love this question. <laughs> Talk about your financial skills and experiences, and what areas would you look at to stretch the budget in a small town police department? And how would you approach that challenge? you know, grants and unions, all that kind of good stuff. So my financial experience. Well, I can tell you, I'm sort of a, in my personal, <laughs> my personal life, I, uh, 
I'm very in tune with this. I, I just purchased a house last year. I have two teen teenage kids, and uh, so I know well the constraints of, of a budget, and a lot of it is definitely a prioritization. Um, you really have to see what your priorities are, and you have to be careful not to overextend yourself. And uh, you know, I'm always researching things and, and finding the best way to, to make purchases and, and smart purchases, sometimes you can't buy the most expensive of things. The same thing with a police department. Sometimes you have to look for what the best deals are and, and what will be the best for you at, at, at that point in time. Um, and it's a lot of give and take, I think, where unfortunately, because there's not so much money to go around, you can't fully fund everything. And uh, that's where it, you it's imperative that you know your department very well and you understand what are the high priority things and and what things might be able to wait is there money from one thing that you could take temporarily for something else and know that you'll concentrate on that other thing later um, of course I know where, where are you Bruce in the finance committee <laughs> maybe can I change that again I'd, I'd like to have Bruce on my three people <laughs> Of my three I, people now, okay. I don't know. Bruce went on a spending spree at the last town meeting. So I don't know if he'd be your best best resource right now. <laughs> he's, he's on your side this year. <laughs> so, so bring bring me back to where your focus wants to be on that question, please. I know I sort of went oh, into my personal. For, for the the chief has a very. I believe is a very difficult job when when our budget just as a our budget process starts probably 20 months before um, so so typically our town administrator will send out a, a notice to our department heads and they start thinking about their budgets and typically the there'll be a, a message and it'll kind of be a state of the state of financial of the mm -hmm. town. And the selectman will kind of set, will kind of set goals or areas that we want to address during the coming year. But how to make a budget, like one question I would have as a follow-up question is how would you stretch your, your staffing and what are your thoughts about part-time versus full-time officers and the advantages of each you know is it you know do you see you know is if you had monies available would you look at adding staffing full-time staffing or part-time part staffing to to target specific times areas or concerns mm -hmm. Actually, I have a lot of experience with that in, in Munson right now. We have a large part-time or reserve force that we supplement with. And again, I do the scheduling, so I, so I have a good feel for how they, they fit into things. And uh, I certainly know that hiring full-time, you know, it's, it's uh, there's obviously, you know, there's benefits and things that go along with that. Um, that it's, and it's certainly usually more expensive. The hourly pay rate versus a part-time officer are usually um, not the same and uh, that part-time employees can can certainly be of tremendous value and uh, it's just that you know you want to make sure that they're well trained as well because you don't want the community to feel they're being slighted I guess maybe by having um, part-time officers as opposed to full-time officers out there responding um, but I, I do think that in a smaller smaller communities that there it's almost a necessity. I, I don't know that there's really an option for having an entire full time force because I don't think that you'll be able to have the coverage that you need. I don't think you'll be able to afford to have that many people out in the community as you would if you supplement with with the part time force. Yeah, I I, I see that. Full-time officers play a critical role, but when you start having a mature um, force, there's vacations and mm -hmm. other things that come into it, and you probably have to look at ways to supplement those um, absence. 
Definitely. And I think full-time officers do offer, you know, they're, mm -hmm. they're out there, they know the community probably better than a part-time officer and the fact that you go buy a house every day and there's a red pickup in the yard. Right. They're more regularly out there, so. Right. So I do understand that, but, uh, um, and again, we, right now, honestly, in Munson, we have uh, part-timers on my shift. <laughs> I work with one two days a week because we have a vacancy. And uh, so I, I am very familiar with that. And I do think they're very, definitely very valuable. And I understand definitely where you're coming from, that uh, once you get into some significant vacation time and things, that, that certainly it, um, it's, it's costly to, uh, to, you know, you have to replace somebody or you have to go without that it, uh, it's definitely more cost effective i think to have some part-time employees available and not to say they can't have a vested interest in the town as well we have some excellent part-time uh, employees that are very experienced and and know the town very well and are certainly assets thank you mm -hmm. right i'm going to just tweak the question a little bit same subject um what, what do you think the appropriate role and interactions should be well, with the local department in keeping uh, our schools actually on their radar? The word safe isn't the question, but I don't think safe. I think safe is a myopic perspective. Mm -hmm. Right, right. Yeah. And, and certainly we, we've seen it with Sandy Hook and things that we hope, you know, don't ever, uh, that we don't ever experience, but... Uh, it, it sort of brings you to, to reality and, and what, you know, the prepared, preparedness level that you have to maintain. And, and I think that certainly, um, as much as we hate to take that view, that uh, there's definitely some certain training uh, that I think that the police department needs to stay up on and certainly have continue to have a good working relationship with the principal there. And uh, I think it's more than just you know driving through at night and checking checking the business but you really need to have some type of a, a role inside as well with the kids and uh, I would certainly promote that with within the department uh, finding the, the right people that are interested in that I, I mean it's something that I would that I would enjoy as well uh, but I think you really need to, to take a realistic look and some serious uh, training uh, active shooter type training and drills not necessary to, to scare kids or anything like that, but certainly um, they need to practice their, their lockdown things, some things that I'm sure they're already doing, but making sure that that's not neglected and, uh, and that, it, you know, that definitely the police department is taking it very seriously as far as keeping up with their training and, and maybe some, uh, some drills, even without you know, the kids in place, but so that the police department's very familiar with the school in case something happens there and what the staff currently, what their training is. What, what do you expect from the staff and the administrators there if something were to happen? I can follow up, Mr. Chair. So I understand the, the uh, sensitive nature of the subject with respect to school and safety. Do you think that the training and active shooter and all that is reactive? And if so, what would you consider proactive? We're, you know, we, 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 know, what we, we know what we fear right mm -hmm. we don't necessarily know what anyway this could go back to the word community that's not my answer go ahead <laughs> well certainly some some pre-planning uh, definitely pre-planning is, is is very important and uh, just any security measures that, that that you can take at the schools um, in fact we sort of had we just did some sort of dispatch training with, um, uh, and I know again you don't have civilian dispatchers, but we had sort of a, a buy-in of, of all the departments. So we had um, the dispatchers were just trained in, in some active shooter um, sort of uh, call taking standards, maybe things of that nature. But it, uh, I just I do think that the pre-planning and the training is definitely very important and it's something that has to be practiced um, thanks I'm not sure that. if I <laughs> okay. Was it? okay well I, if I could follow up on sure. that what what, do you, what has what has been your experience working with the DA's office and or the the uh, state police mm -hmm. in, in a lot of times 
I mean, someone to ha handle an active shooter, it's it would be very difficult, A, to bring the resources to bear. Right. So how, how would you work with, how, or do you envision, would you envision working with the state police and or the DA's office? Absolutely. The, the thing about a small town and, and an, even Munson, you know, being larger than Sunderland, I mean, we still have the same problem. We, we have two officers on a shift, possibly, uh, and if we have someone, a... Uh, someone to be watched in the station under arrest, then that might mean one officer. And uh, so if you have something of that magnitude happen, you know, you, you're you always trained that even as the, the only officer there, or one or two, that you have to act immediately. And you're going to rely on anybody and everybody who can possibly show up. And you're certainly, that would include the state police. Uh, we were actually involved in a training uh, with the state police, sort of a, uh, collaborative training so um, it's uh, it's very important that that, uh, that you have a good working relationship with them and uh, any pre-planning would certainly involve other agencies and I mean it would involve inside your town as well I mean you're you're going to rely on not just you know fire department you know you've got your South County EMS but also even your DPW would be involved so it's it's sort of a town-wide thing and then and then any other agency that's available to render aid so and as far as the DA's office you know I understand it certainly um, in any uh, large-scale situations that uh, we often get them involved certainly a, uh, like a fatal accident or something we look for a, a member to to respond and uh, generally we involve the state police in that as well reconstruction and, and their crime scene services things of that nature so it's not really foreign it's something we sort of do mm -hmm. on a regular basis Good. thank you Davey in, in a way that kind of leads into the, in the next one um, so like, what next steps would you explore as a police chief for police department regionalization opportunities? And, and I kind of also, not just regionalization, but like regional cooperation, because like, mm -hmm. you know, if you look at like an active shooter kind of thing, mm -hmm. let's say at the high school, where that's shared by several towns. Mm -hmm. Well, that's interesting because that's actually a question I sort of had for you because I <laughs> did read through the, uh, the study that was done last year uh, about the you know, benefits and cost of regionalization with Waitley and, and, uh, and Deerfield. Um, but, uh, and certainly in, in an active shooter type situation, um, basically uh, you're going to be relying on those other agencies as well. So uh, collaboration with those agencies, of course, in responding. you just repeat the first part yeah, of that yeah, there? I lost track of... It, it, what next steps would you explore as a police chief for okay. police department regionalization opportunities? Right. Well, and I, I believe that Sunderland already operates under a, a mutual aid agreement in Franklin County, and we have something similar in place where I currently work. And uh, it's it's been great, actually. Uh, no more, really, you know, it's all sort of permission-based and things in the past, and, and now people can sort of just act in the roles that they need to act in in these situations. So, um, and again, I know the regionalization, I think that the study was talking about is a little different than the regionalization that, that you're talking about, maybe more um, shared resources, yeah. um, some collaboration. And certainly, I know, um, I actually know, I know of John, Petrarch in, in Deerfield, I, and he's worked a couple of different places. I'm a little familiar with him, but certainly I'd, you know, that would be something that I'd be even looking to do in the first six months is I really want to reach out to some of the surrounding agencies. I want to get to know them and uh, how, how things are currently going, how we're interacting, um, and understanding that some of these things are not necessarily right in Sunderland. For instance, the EMS now, I know that's kind of new, but South County's, you know, sort of a collaborative thing now. and. Uh, um, the senior center also so just sort of reaching out to some of these agencies and other area police departments and getting to know sort of how we currently do share resources or mutual aid how how that's been going and, and make a plan where to go and it kind of ties in with cooperation with the fire department because uh, mm -hmm. we haven't 
We've had our wind incidents here, not quite as bad as <laughs> them, but there, there used to be actually a barn right near the safety complex that was kind of deposited in the middle of the road one year. So, okay. so we've had our, uh, our wind incidents too. Yeah. The neat part, it was, it was standing. It yeah, yes, yeah, just yep. wow. literally. <laughs> Interesting. A couple of years where we had a lot of um, microbursts and quote unquote tornadoes and things blow through. So. Oh yeah. We had a, actually a, a, actually my plumber <laughs> in Munson, his, his home was actually lifted up, turned upside down and uh, deposited back on the ground with, and his wife was inside at the time nice. and uh, survived. So it's, uh, it's miraculous what force okay. and, yeah. and things can happen. Okay. Jane, if, if, regionalization, if regionalization collaboration was further explored, what benefits and challenges would you see from a shared um, or co cooperative police force? And how would you build support from officers and regionalized towns for an expanded department? And, and it, at least not, not only just the, but if I'm talking about a shared administrator, mm -hmm. not necessarily combined forces, Back but up. three separate departments that would work together oh, under three. one okay. sheet. So I, okay. So it is sort of, we, we've actually explored that a little bit with the town of Munson. It's been talked about on just the dispatch side. It's been talked about um, as a whole. And so I do know, you know, some of the, the, the feelings on it and things that I've, you know, heard from, from both sides. And uh, certainly it can augment your police forces. You're going to have more officers and you're, you might have, for instance, in the town of Sunderland, maybe there's, you might not have some specialties and things because you just don't, uh, you don't have the money for it or you don't have the draw for it. Um, certainly with combined forces, you'll have more specialized positions, you'll have a larger force, uh, but also it's how do you mesh these people? How do you deal with seniority within one department, seniority within another department. These are concerns of, of the officers and, uh, you know, pay rates and who's going to supervise who and, you know, it's, um, it's really, there's a lot more to it, I think, than, than what you maybe you see on paper. It, it sounds great and everything and I, I do think there are benefits, but there are definitely uh, some concerns and certainly I would have to say being under one unified command um, probably would be maybe a question for some of your interviewees here today <laughs> because if that were to come to fruition, what does happen, say, with your police chief position in Sunderland, you know, your police chief position in, in Waitley, and what happens with your sergeant in Sunderland, and what happens with those officers, and, and uh, how do you mesh all that together? Because a lot of positions do sometimes get absorbed when you regionalize, and uh, but certainly there's some financial benefits, uh, you know, pooling some money uh, as opposed to having to provide the same services on each, you know, each town's limited budget. But what I, I'd look at more like how, how, how could you use region, more regional cooperation to benefit things like training? Mm -hmm. uh, how, how, you know, when I, when I, when I look at that, I look at how, how, how would you look outside the box and say, it's easy to say, okay, um, and, and I would not, the, the one thing I would caution is not to say the only place that we could look for regional cooperations is Whiteley and Deerfield. Mm -hmm. No, I'm just I, mentioning yeah. that only because right. I, 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 I would, that. I would say that, that there, there's other op options available mm -hmm. to us as well. I would think, how would you, how, how could you use that to benefit the town? And, uh, you know, would, and, and I, I'm looking at training, um, familiarity between, between the, uh, the forces. Um, I, I personally think that um, our mutual aid, our, our police work, the, the area works real well together because I think we are kind of like a force multiplier through our mm -hmm. the, the mutual aid. Um, and I think it's a good idea that the officers in Deerfield know the officers in Sundland just mm -hmm. like they know the officers in Leverett and Shootsbury and Montague. I, I think that's important. And, and I, I guess that's how, how, would, how would you work as an officer, you know, chief of a 
you'd be Sunderland, but maybe with a couple other departments mm -hmm. also. So it'd be a shared chief's position versus a regional position. That's, I guess that's what I'm looking at. Okay. Well, and certainly with training, I mean, with your sort of being able to pool your resources and you're also having, um, if you know, you're going to have some continuity because everybody's being trained the same. And um, you're working together, you're going to training together, so you're getting used to working together and you're learning things the same way. And certainly there's a cost savings and um, that maybe it's, you're not duplicating as many positions either, you know, if you, um, with more officers. Um, and, and I think that is definitely something that, that is very important is that it would sort of streamline things maybe and your communications and and everything being that you're you're unified um, you don't have three really individual ways of doing things that you're sort of a conglomerate and uh, definitely more efficient i would say okay scotty thank you i, I had to write down the word conglomerate <laughs> not how often you hear that <laughs> Sorry. So we're going from the discussion, the line of questioning about a relatively small regional component. Let's talk about social media, because Lord knows there's a community that's just rife with all kinds of fun <laughs> things. What's the benefit of social media to a police force, and how would you use it to keep in touch with the community? It's already being used by, by many police departments, and we were actually laughing when we first came in, um, you know, talking to Gary and uh, how with my interview with the search committee that uh, I brought up that there had been uh, a robbery in town and uh, that because I had actually noticed that it was posted on, on Facebook and uh, and he didn't even know about it yet, you know. So it's certainly a way to get things out very quickly to the community. And um, it's with so many people being sort of addicted to social media maybe that uh, you, you get actually much more response I think from from the community if you need their assistance if you put out a photo or something that you're looking for need information on or trying to you know if somebody recognizes a particular individual you you get quick responses and you hit so many people so you're describing it as a tool an active tool mm -hmm. so what's the positive part of it so the positive, the positive part. I another think. positive. Part. Okay. Is there another one? Follow up, Mr. Chair. I almost think that people feel more connected with the police department because they're getting such timely information, and it's they're not always looking for the public's help, but they're you know sending out little tidbits here and there. You know, Munson not too long ago rescued an owl from the roadway. I mean, you know, and so we we see things like that, and actually the the public loves that I think you they feel more connected because they don't just hear from you when there's something big going on and uh, that it's sort of a day-to-day day -day communication I think that's what people really love about social media okay great thanks <laughs> I'm actually with Gary on this one I didn't know either <laughs> <laughs> David? Well, just as a quick follow-up before the next question, too, like what, what, what do you think of some of the negatives of that? Because it, it can have you know, a flip side to that, too. Right. Well, and we certainly experienced this in the, the past couple of years with uh, various things. You know, it, it started with Ferguson, Ferguson and, and uh, basically with police being sort of portrayed negatively in social media. And it's, I think a lot of it is that uh, there's some misinformation going out and that only partial things are getting posted. And unfortunately, there's really no checks and balances on that. So, you know, people are posting what they want to post and, and a lot of people read that. And I think a lot of assumptions are, are being made and, and uh, that not necessarily everything that is posted on social media is 100% true and all the facts are there. Um, and, and I think that can be a negative because they're making judgments without being informed. Yep. Mm -hmm. You have a follow-up, Mr. Chair? All right. So does Munson currently have, and, and just as a aside, we do mm -hmm. uh, have a current uh, policy centered around uh, the use of social media? We actually do, yes. <laughs> 
we do as well. <laughs> All right, to sort of continue along the, the, the lines of changes, what impacts on small towns or regional policing do you see new technologies? Because it's all over the news too now. You're seeing like such as body cameras, drones, and now the uh, Ford has like sort of like black boxes essentially in patrol mm -hmm. cars. Um, what influences do you see them having, and are they positive, and are they you know, helping to improve over current methods? Mm -hmm. or they, you could go either way, obviously. Like right. the same thing with social media, but yeah. and I think that's sort of the direction that, that I would have to take. You certainly see some positives, but, um, you know, there, there's definitely concerns, I think, too. We've, um, you know, the body cameras certainly um, can depict an, an accurate uh, picture of, of something that occurred, but uh, I know that, you know, different departments and things in, in trying to write their policies are, um, that it's not an easy task. and. You know, when do, what about officers? Do they get to view uh, the footage before writing their reports? Or, um, you know, different things of, of that nature. So, so there's definitely some positive, but there's definitely some, some concerns and, and things that have to be weighed, I think, before just implementing them. Uh, but certainly they can be valuable tools when they're used in it. It's new territories. So it's it kind, is. It's kind it of is. hard to, to come up with some policies sometimes. Okay. Jane, and as a role of chief, how would you describe success? Success of the role of chief. To me, success would be sort of twofold. Having officers on the department that want to stay, that are enjoying their work enjoy working for the department and for the town or within the town and having a community that and happy isn't really the word i guess and i don't know if satisfied is the word but that uh, they have a positive sort of feeling i guess as far as the police department that they feel that the police department are making a good attempt to to recognize their needs and putting forth an effort to to do the things that, that are important to them, but also the police department feeling that the community is supportive of them and uh, likes the work that they do. I think to me that would be success, is to have a really good working relationship between the community and the police department. And. Um Do you consider yourself more of a tactical or a strategic person? I would say more towards strategic maybe, but sort of a blend, I guess I would say. Um, I guess that's what I would say. But what do you want to follow up with? I know you have something. <laughs> I, 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 I just think Sometimes we ask questions that we don't necessarily know where it's going to mm -hmm. go. Um, and I th say, last time we had, and I could give you this question. Uh, <laughs> we had a we had a, a resident ask us to ask a question that says, "What is joint venture?" We didn't know. Mm -hmm. We all looked at one another. We didn't have any idea, and we just kind of looked at it and said. Okay, mm -hmm. and at that time we had five candidates, and we got five different answers. Right. Um, and I'm sure each one thought they were right. <laughs> I'm sure they were, but it, it, it's and I guess that was that was more of a question. Of, is I don't know where you would go with that, mm -hmm. you know, tactical or strategic. Um, but I think it kind of tells me a little bit, you know. Being a math person, <laughs> I think there's a lot of strategy in math. Mm -hmm. um, I guess that's what I'd have to say. Looking at my probably my traits and and, and character, that that's why I would say that. Okay. Any other questions, Connie? I I get to ask the best question. What's that, Connie? You have any questions for us? <laughs> <laughs> 
Well, I think the main question I did have was actually regarding the, the regionalization and sort of what the current status is and what your thoughts are on that. And I know you mentioned, well, not necessarily maybe um, those particular communities that maybe you're, you're thinking about something else, but I just didn't know where that was because I read the study and, and it sort of just left off saying, eh, well, I think we need some more data and, and things. And so I didn't know what direction you were heading with that. You want me to answer? Yeah, you want to answer? Well, Tom, I know you're on that council, right? <laughs> well, you know, the um, it was an interesting meeting because I we, we, it was some background on on that. Um, there was really a question about cooperation and regional, and I think the question had been um, was studied by the Franklin. We're part of what they call the Franklin Council of Regional of Governments, and they were they were starting to do some they were starting to do a study for us, and I think um, the question really wasn't fully explored because I think it was talking about joining the three forces. Well, where it ended up was that we were going to join the three forces and have one chief and and we were all going to be integrated into one department. And I don't necessarily think that that's where we were looking to go at that particular time. We were kind of looking at um, looking at working the three departments together, maybe someday having a single administration versus the present three administrations, you know, having um, chief for the three different towns. Maybe that's what we would have worked into, but it was more about um, cooperating maybe closer, more closely together. Um, it, I, I think also um, you said something about your, you were involved with training as training officer. Mm -hmm. Um, and our we have a we have a union um, believe it or not we have a, a favorable working condi uh, relationship with our police union I would say we 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 worked very we work we actually have worked very well with our union um, it gives it allows them to if they have concerns to speak directly to us to, mm -hmm. through, the, through the channels which is kind of a nice thing so you don't have um, Cruisers pulling into Slackman's yard with, with <laughs> in the dark, <laughs> in the night. They drive into the garage, you know. They drive right, into right. the garage, and, and but but allows us to have a conversation. If there's a concern, we, we have a mechanism for 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 a conversation. So so I I kind of thought, you know, we we're looking, uh, and, but part of that contract is we have training officers, um, and I thought by having you know, if we shared, if we have a, um, a weapons officer, someone that trains in weapons, well, now they can train three departments instead of two departments or one department and um, domestics, you know, we'd, and so we would, we could maybe expand the opportunities for our officers also mm -hmm. if there's something that would, would interest them. I see. I, I still think um, those, that potential may be still there. Um, and, and and it may start by not sharing a chief, but all the three community, you know, the three towns getting. And again, it doesn't have to be Deerfield or Whiteley or Conway. We have to have towns to the east and south of us also that we could kind of work together, um, and and maybe join forces in that respect. Um, so that's what that's what we are looking at. Um, so it's not necessarily a officer or one unified chief. Um, and it could be, but we really haven't gotten where we had that real conversation, conversation yet, yet, unfortunately. Okay. Because um, one of the things that we learned um, is that we could not provide, like our South County EMS, we couldn't provide that EMS service on our own. Right. That was just impossible. But together, we have a much we have a, a better program. We're answering our calls. We, we tremendously reduced our uh, response times um, and something that the three towns can be very proud about. So maybe that's what we, in, in, in just different way, we're, we're trying to do different, find different ways to uh, become force multipliers, I guess a different way you could say. Right. Um, and back to the, like the DA's question, 
It was inter- it was interesting. We have a Franklin County Stuckman's Association, and it was a ama- we were amazed because we had a meeting where the DA talked to us about um, active shooters mm-hmm. in schools, and the program, the DA, the DA office actually runs a program where they come out and review the programs of school safety with the the chief and the schools, and believe it or not. Most, if not all, selectmen didn't know anything about that, and many <clears throat> of our police and our schools didn't know anything about that either. So it's it's, it's so it's it's interesting um, what's out there and sometimes what we don't take advantage right. of. I'm sure that's a tremendous resource. <laughs> yeah, and and, and, and I, I guess those those in in our our chief look we we depend on, we. We demand a lot of our chiefs. Mm-hmm. I mean, and, and you see, I'm sure you've seen that. He, he, like Southwick and um, Munson, and the, the chief is not a part time job. It's a no. full time, very um, integrated in the communities. Um, and those are important things to us. Right. Any other good questions for us? I guess that's pretty much, pretty much it. I've, I've sort of answered quite a few of my questions by doing some research and things, and and uh, I wanted to make sure this was the place I wanted to apply as much as, <laughs> you know, determine it's the right fit for me as well as me being the right fit for you. So, um, well, when we have a business, a new business come into town, we either get a liquor license or a particular license mm-hmm. or we always give them a an opportunity to sell themselves so if you want to give us a uh, final summation and sell yourself to our board and our committee <laughs> you, you you have the floor Jane it's been very pleasurable talking to you today well, thank you thank you it's this has been honestly a tremendous uh, experience and uh, I I sort of mentioned this with the the search committee that uh, uh, I've been waiting for the right opportunity to present itself. It's uh, I'm not looking at just uh, taking on another job, you know, and uh, I don't just send out my resume anywhere. And uh, and I did. I really researched things before I chose to apply, and I wanted to make sure that uh, that I felt like I was a good fit for the town and the police department. And uh, and then it's really what uh, what I would be looking for at this point in my career. And uh, and I have to say from not just from what I've read but now actually getting to meet some of the people and uh, you know I, I could see already I watched some of your meetings and I could see how you interact and and uh, uh, I really got a pretty good feeling you know I, I watched the interview with, with Sherry and uh, I, I could tell just I, I think you make people feel really comfortable and and uh, I th- you can tell that you're very dedicated and you have the best interests of the town at heart and I just want to say that I I felt like the search committee did a tremendous job and they were very dedicated and uh, just some really really nice people so um, so I just I, I'd really I know you have my resume and I know we've talked about my experience and uh, I just I feel like I've had some good life experience I'm uh, I uh, 40 something ish so I've been out there for a while and uh, I've had some varied experiences in in policing and the different roles that I've that I've taken and I think it's it's all sort of uh, come together to uh, to this end and uh, so I I felt very comfortable coming in here and uh, I don't really have any reservations about the the position and uh, and I just it's been a great process and no matter where it goes from here I've I've thoroughly enjoyed it and uh, learned a lot about the town I probably come out here maybe to hike or try a little kayaking or something and uh, maybe stop by Gary's bike shop or something and say hi but because uh, we found we have we do have sort of a, uh, a, a mutual uh, enjoyable uh, hobby so <laughs> but uh, I do I just want to thank you thank you very much we mm-hmm. appreciate your uh, coming to talk to us tonight and uh, good luck thank you okay thanks so much David, it's nice to meet you. Yeah. <laughs> Scott, <coughs> nice, and Tom. Okay. Now, we still have business to attend to.
There's still something in there, right? Other business, anyway. More business. Yeah. Um, minutes of May 9th. We get to open. We get to public. Sure. His <coughs> question, but we get to public session. When we get to public comment, he can ask. Oh, you want to do public comment? Just a quick question. Sure. Go ahead. Um, this is all recorded. Yes. Yep. Yep. When will this be put on available online? Marina? That's a question for our producer back there. So tomorrow, probably our editor will edit it. It's on right now live. Um, and tomorrow, it'll be edited and then put on our YouTube page. So you can find it on YouTube on FCAT. If you go my, my concern, uh, Tom, is the integrity of the interviews. Mm -hmm. Oh, yeah. The other two Absolutely. might be able to have an upper hand. That's, I took notes. Yeah. I'm, I want to leave them with Sherry and then just come back tomorrow and take the, my notes. Uh, and the, hard, the, hardest, the hardest part, the hardest part we have, and, and I, I'm, glad you, I'm, I'm glad you said that, the hardest part that we have um, in the process is that for us it's an open, it's a, we're used to it now, it's an open process. Um, we kind of depend on the integrity of the individuals that are applying to step away and not take advantage of this advantage because you're absolutely right. Yeah. Unfortunately, we have no um, control over that. Um, so, I mean, if I, you know, I'm sure, share Marina, I'm sure that um, they're going to put it up on YouTube as, as soon as possible, but usually we don't see it there for a couple, two, three days after it's aired. Yeah. Yeah. So. Thank you for your time. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Thank you. Raise a good point. Good. 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 We appreciate your question. Mm -hmm. it, would, it wouldn't have been five years ago. It might have been in the paper on Friday. Yeah. Yeah. If you're lucky. Yeah. <laughs> no, I understand. <laughs> I appreciate it. Thank you. Thanks so much. Thank you. Okay. Minutes of May 9th. Uh, motion. On the minutes, voluminous minutes. I appreciate you actually attaching, uh, if I could, Mr. Chair, attaching the actual beacon analysis as well. So mm -hmm. I'll second the motion. Motion made and second to on the minutes of May 9th. All those in favor, please signify by saying aye. 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 Declare it unanimous. 3 0. Um, Board of Selectmen updates. Uh, uh, we had a, there was a, <laughs> Working group meeting last week with uh, FR COG housing Alyssa helping the 120 North Main Street folks and Sherry helping as well uh, develop the framework for and collect the raw data for the RFP um, mm. for design developer. And it was a pretty active discussion about keeping uh, an impact on the design but recognizing that at some point you you simply you 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 give up that authority in the process you simply do yeah. you want you want to keep a seat at the table you want to have the best possible project it's a really high visibility you want to have it meet the intent of the original discussion and town meeting and then at some point you let it go <laughs> Send your kid and the process the takes over yeah. i would say there was also some discussion about the um and you guys have heard me use the phrase in the past, the acronym soup. How many agencies does it take to make senior housing? And really, um, there was a, there was a uh, interesting interaction about how it's advertised, and and the usual suspects came up. And you know, the usual suspects being a category of people who are or agencies or developers or financiers or etc. Or even architects, architectural mm. firms who specialize sure. in this. And the question was raised about, well, how do you approach the unusual suspects? Mm. Keep you know, how do you get it out to Impressive. those those potential individuals yep. who might think, question. huh? How do we go about that? Mm. So again, we're, we're about uh, two to three weeks forward. Our next meeting is in two weeks. And uh, that is to bring back the framework. I want to uh, again thank Sherry. She came with a draft, like fill in the blanks. Let's post this tonight. <laughs> <laughs> I was like, whoa, there whoa, whoa! <laughs> he was ready to go. So it was all good. That's all. It's interesting, Scott, because um, and I and I've heard over the last it seems over the last couple months there's there's people in town that are 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 getting to a point. 
and it, it just happens all the time. Mm-hmm. I'm just saying people that I know that are reaching um, a point in their life where they're making changes. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Oh, yeah. And, mm-hmm. and, and the, the house that they maintain, they're no mm-hmm. longer able to maintain. Yep. So the whole thing about the senior housing, that ha- the need hasn't gone away. No, 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 and, no. and I think it's actually has increased. Yep. Um, so I, 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 and again, just so everybody knows, the Board of Selectmen is, are, were in the, in the 120 North Main Street are working on it, diligent. We're going to try to, we are going to bring this to fruition because it is important for us. Good point. Yeah, watch for an RFP draft. Uh, I'm sure the timetable we were talking about was late July at the latest. Yeah. By the time it's done, advertised, and the first yeah. round goes out. <laughs> So we'll see. Good. I think you're right about the need, though, Tom. I it think this is only going to make a small dent in that need. That it, it hasn't changed, and, yeah. and and it's and it's when you and as one of my other things is the uh, board of oversight for the uh, senior center. Um, you listen to some of the seniors and and our director talk about the needs. Oh. That need hasn't gone away. Right. You know, people that um, may have. Medicals, and they had houses that had two or three floors, and they just they no longer can maintain a residence in a, a house that has two or three floors, or it just they just can't maintain the house the physical anymore. Physical work of keeping it up. It, you know, they may have three bedrooms and three baths, and mm-hmm. you know, a huge kitchen and entertain. And it was great when they were their children were yeah. at home, and, and exactly. or they may lose their husband or lose their wife, yeah. and just cannot maintain it. So it is a it is a huge it is a huge concern. So. Can I bring up one other thing, Mr. Chair? Absolutely. So as we were talking uh, post-town meeting, one of the appropriations in the capital project was the um, funding for uh, the questions to be answered from CHA with regard to North Main Street reconstruction. Yeah. Yeah. Could I ask that we get that in the next three, four weeks? Bring them in and say, you know, here mm. this they say they gave us a list of what those responses and inquiries were from planning board, public input, our board uh, about design exceptions. Uh, I think maybe sooner rather than later, we should get after getting those answers. I, I also wanted to follow up that uh, Dana Roscoe had written a note about a concern about. Have, have we followed up on that concern also, Sherry? He was wondering because he hadn't seen Sunwell on a list. There was a list. Yes, he sent oh, a letter. Oh yes. yes, and we followed up with that. Yes, okay. That's that. And yeah, so did the that. FERCOG. Thank you. All right, David. Um, I don't have any uh, any updates this week other than I'm doing some extra follow up on the uh, solar issue. So um, might be some other opportunities for us to follow in in in, in addition to what you were mentioning last week, Tom. So excellent. Excellent. Um, the Board of Oversight for the um, um, <clears throat> South County EMS has a meeting this coming Thursday. Um, so we'll be meeting, and the RFP is out for the housing of the uh, South County EMS. So nice. if anybody has a building that has at least 3,000 square feet and can handle three ambulances and a crew of paramedics and EMT people then um, have at it bring them on yeah Sherry um, I did follow up on the questions uh, with regard to the solar project in town meeting uh, that you had asked me to and um, at the special town meeting held in January 2013 under article 2 the town voted to authorize the board to lease for installation a solar facility at the Sunderland Elementary School and also authorized the board to enter into a power purchase agreement. Um, and both authorizations are for 20-year terms. Um, at the annual town meeting in April of 2015, the town voted under Article 19 to approve an agreement between the town and the owner um, of the solar project at the elementary school, uh, an agreement for payment of real and personal property taxes. So. Um, those authorizations are in place and we're, we're ready to move forward with Good. that as well. Uh, we're just working on the supplier mm-hmm. um, agreement with the school. Um, the other thing, the community compact signing is tomorrow morning at 9 o'clock in Phillipston. 
I don't know if anyone is able to attend. I did reach out to Scott and Tom, uh, but. It, yeah. yeah, sorry. Yeah. Right, so, so, so I'd the, like to uh, entertain a motion to allow Sherry to uh, sign for us tomorrow. Yeah, second. For the town of Sunwell. Uh, uh, second. Uh, yeah. Motion and second. Okay. Mm -hmm. We have a motion made and seconded. All in favor of uh, the motion, please signify by saying aye. 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 Sherry? Good job. Good. Make sure you take <laughs> Make sure you take the yeah. special signing panel. Yeah, it's, it's, about, it's about this big. It kind of goes with those big checks. You know? <laughs> yeah, the big checks. Uh, the other thing, the complete streets, uh, we <clears> met <throat> last week and mm. have a draft policy for the board to review. You'll see that in, in your packets. Oh, nice. And I'd like to schedule that for a discussion at a public meeting oh, next nice. week um, with the hope that the board would adopt it so we can move forward with um, the Tier 2 prioritization planning. Sherry, you thinking that's going to be an evening meeting? Yes. Just as part of a regular board meeting, okay. we don't have to do anything special. Just uh, have it no on the session. agenda for, for discussion, okay. and then if the board adopts it that night, we'll, you'll meet the requirements. Great. Um, also, you have correspondence from the town of Shootsbury um, expressing interest in exploring uh, a shared police chief position. You'll see that. Um, in your packet as well. Um, working with town council on the boat launch project and they're in the process of drafting the order of taking for the board signature and I hope to have that for you next week. This is like reminiscent of a joke, right? How many lawyers <laughs> does it take to make a boat launch? <laughs> oh, there's also for your review a draft um, agreement for peg access. Uh, grant agreement if that's something that the board is interested in. Mm -hmm. uh, the landfill vent inspection. Uh, uh, we received a proposal from Stantec uh, for repair of the broken vent pipes at the old landfill. Uh, the estimated cost for that repair is $2,500. Mm -hmm. um, they'll also prepare um, a response um, on the status of the repairs to DEP. Um, they're also recommending that we uh, maintain the site and uh, cut the grass up there. Um, I'm reviewing the budget to see if there's any money left in the budget that we could go ahead and uh, proceed with the repairs, mm -hmm. if that's okay. Uh, mm -hmm. If not, I was thinking I could perhaps request a reserve fund transfer because it was unforeseen. Yeah. Right. Okay. Do, do we think that was from vandalism or just wear and tear kind of? Mm. Not, not really sure. No, a bunch really of them sure. are busted over smooth and yeah. Yeah. Just wonder, like, yeah, we repair them, that'll be in a run into the same thing again. We will. You know, yeah. That's what I thought. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> it's just to clarify. Well, what 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 it, what, it did, yeah. what was nice that came out of it was with uh, Janamine and company is that they were able to actually locate them all. Well, yeah, right, because they have to go through that whole right. process. Yeah, there was of, quite a few, twenty-one yeah. or something. Yeah. yeah, they were able to actually find them all, and they were all repairable, That's as good. opposed to having to be recreated. Yeah. Right. Good. I met with the FERCOG last week um, to discuss the DLTA projects and all the things that um, they have going on with the town. Uh, they did send an update uh, report for you to review. Oh, I, good. I sent it by email and you have it in your packet as well. I met with Chris Collins um, for FCAT for leasing space, showed mm -hmm. him the downstairs uh, last week. Oh, good. We're just looking for some measurements mm -hmm. up here so that I can um, put an RFP together for the lease of the space. And he was going to contact the board of directors to see if they'd like to take a look sure. downstairs sure. as well. Uh, what else? Oh, Peb. Last but not least. <laughs> oh, that spiffy booklet down <laughs> yeah. there. Uh, last week, uh, Susan and I and uh, Brian met with a representative from the Bartholomew group mm -hmm. to discuss um, OPEB. And to uh, Su Susan is wondering if we'd <clears> like to move forward with... Um, an agreement for investment and management of the trust fund money. Uh, Bartholomew put forth a proposal um, and they are overseeing quite a few towns, uh, trusts. So we're just wondering uh, about proceeding with that, if you'd like to have them come in and present to the board. Sure, absolutely. Mm -hmm. okay. I could schedule that. Okay. Yeah, that, would, that would be, I would wonder if that, uh, that would end up being under Susan's, you know, rec and Sherry's final recommendation, but still, somehow out 
to bid for the service. I would I would fear that in particular long term management of the OPEB trust could. You may have to develop an RFP for yeah, that yeah. and go out. But Some I mean, it'd be on. interesting to hear what they have to say. So oh, I totally get why, it. Yeah. Why I would ask why we'd have to have an outside group managing instead of the treasurer. Right. Right. Mm -hmm. Right. Good question. Yeah. I mean, I don't ever know. Look at all our options. Mm -hmm. Look, we we know that investing of municipal money is very limited. There's only so many things yeah. that you can do. Yeah. Sure. There's two companies yeah. um, that we looked at. Yeah. So. Okay. Okay. Sherry, I also would like to thank you for uh, the suggestion that you made to the uh, FERCOC. Looks like they took it to. Uh, yeah. They like that suggestion, so hopefully other town administrators will get on board also. Um, or for a regional board of selectmen, that one. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Regionalize everything. Hey. Well, I, I I think it's important that <laughs> you're not you can't get things done if you don't communicate with one another. Right. And, and, if we, and if we all stay, if we all stay in our little boxes mm -hmm. and and don't look outside the box, we mm -hmm. we don't get anything accomplished, in my opinion. So I thought Sherry's suggestion was mm -hmm. very good suggestion, and, and again, it's no different than talking to the you know the superintendent, mm -hmm. you know, on a quarterly basis. So good, good suggestion, excellent job. I'll second that. Um, they did send out a doodle poll, so we are working on coordinating a meeting with the town administrators and the planners at the FERCOG. Uh, it's a good thing when the two come together, because uh, they bring, bring different things to the table. No matter how we're moving forward and what we're doing, we need good planning documents, and that's where the COG is just you know so important right. to our position. So um, I'm looking forward to working with them. So it's a good conversation. It's been well, you know, half a year now of getting to know them. Mm -hmm. Are they are they are they fitting the bill for you? Yeah, they've been very responsive. I've had uh, several meetings with them now, and they've mm -hmm. been open to suggestions um, and sharing ideas, uh, pointing me at other resources, um, reaching out to different state entities as well to right. uh, help me coordinate some nice. projects. So great. Yeah. All set? All set. Okay, resignation part-time officer, Mr. Clark. Yes, indeed. <clears throat> this is uh, <clears throat> dated 429-2016. Dear OIC Sergeant Lyons, please accept this letter as a notification of my resignation as a part-time police officer with the Sunderland Police Department. My last day of employment will be Friday, May 13th, 2016, two weeks from today's date. It's been a pleasure to work for the Sunderland Police Department. Unfortunately, I feel that it is time for me to utilize my experience and training in a full-time capacity. I am sincerely grateful and appreciative for the opportunity to serve the town of Sunderland. However, it is in my best interest to accept a full-time police officer position with the Ware Police Department. I appreciate being able to gain a better understanding of law enforcement and for the training opportunities that were provided. I wish the Sunderland Police Department, all of its staff, and the town of Sunderland all the best. If there's anything I can do to assist the department slash town with my transition, please let me know. That regards, Brandon M. Blair. Motion. Uh, motion to accept the resignation. Second. The uh, one disadvantage of having part-time officers is, yeah, is that they get full-time positions. That's right, they do. Yeah. And um, I would say that's a reflection of us hiring good part-time officers. Um, and Brendan, we uh, hope you continued success in your chosen career path. All those in favor, signify by saying aye. 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 Three zero. Next. Next up, we have a resignation of our plumbing and gas inspector. This is dated May 3rd, 2016, to the Board of Selectmen. Dear Selectmen, effective June 1st, 2016, I resign from my position of plumbing and gas inspector. I have contacted the alternate plumbing inspector, Steve Baranowski, and he has agreed to become the new inspector. I appreciate giving me your for giving me the opportunity to serve my community since 2003 as the plumbing and gas inspector. Sincerely, Jeffrey K. Hubbard. All right, Jeffrey's resigning. He moved out, starting a new life. 
Uh, motion to accept the resignation and uh, recognize the years in service. Uh, second. Okay, I have a motion made and seconded. Accept Jeffrey's uh, letter of resignation. All those in favor, please signify by saying aye. Aye. Three zero. Um, next up, we have two more candidates to go tomorrow and Wednesday. So we will be here tomorrow, 6.30? I think 6.30, right? Yeah. Mm -hmm. All right, gentlemen. All right. Same bad time, slightly earlier. Sorry, slightly earlier bad, bad time. time. Same, Same bad, bad channel, channel, though. And Hulu channel. now. <laughs> okay. All those, uh, I'll look for a motion. Motion uh, to adjourn. Second. A motion made and seconded. Anything else? All those in favor, say aye. 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 3.75. <laughs> <laughs> Only because we have to come back and do it again tomorrow. <laughs> we are out at 8.32.